Stay tuned. Coming up is my interview with Dr. Burton Clark, where we talk about dyslexia in the fire service. Hello and welcome to the Situational Awareness Matters show, episode 396. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by Gasaway Virtual Training. There are 33 online training programs there for you to choose from. Some of the programs are live events presented virtually, and some of the programs are pre recorded. To learn more, visit the essaymatters.com website and click on the virtual training tab. All right, let's jump into our feature segment my interview with Dr. Barton Clark as we talk about dyslexia in the fire service. And you're gonna to wanna to stick around after the interview because I'm gonna share a very personal story that only a handful of people who know me know this. So stick around for that. Hey everyone, welcome to the Situational Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gasway, and today I have a special guest, Dr. Bert Clark, uh, who this is now his third time being a guest on the show. Dr. Burton Clark, EFO, has been in the fire service for 53 years. He was the management science chair at the National Fire Academy. His degrees are in business and education, and he served on 20 different dissertation committees, which is quite a gift to be able to have somebody uh, serve on a committee to help you through your dissertation process. He was the visiting scholar at St. John, uh, I'm sorry, at Johns Hopkins University Center for Fire Safety Research and Policy. He's a board member of the Fire Service Psychological Association and expert technical reviewer for the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health Firefighter Fatality Investigation and Prevention Program. In 2021, he was inducted into the National Fire Heritage Center's Hall of Legends. His book is I Can't Save You and Don't Want to Die Trying, the American Fire Culture. As I said, this is Bert's third time being a guest on the show. The first was way back in episode 38, which would have been back in 2014 uh, when we discussed his book. And then episode 252. Uh, where we discussed assumed risk versus created risk. And today's episode, where we're going to be discussing dyslexia in the fire service. Welcome, Bert. Richard, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I can't believe how quickly time flies by, my friend. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? You know, I, I knew you had been guest two times. I actually had to go back to see when that was. And, uh, you know, episode number 38, um was in the first year of the, wow. of the show being in existence and uh the first uh i don't know 20 or so episodes was just me kind of laying down some introductory stuff and i didn't really start bringing guests in uh until around episode 20 and i just started reaching out to people and lining up the guests and and uh and i remember I, I had the short list of the people that I wanted to get on as guests and uh, some were available and some were not there busy and such. So, but when you said you'd come on and we got to talk about your book, that was, that was really cool. And then later on with the episode 252, uh, that actually, you might recall, uh, cause that's been uh Oh gosh, I I don't have the year pinned on that, but that was probably two thousand eighteen or so, seventeen or eighteen. We were we were having a conversation on 
uh, a thread uh, either on LinkedIn or Facebook mm -hmm. about this assumed risk or created risk. And we decided right there in the thread that we would do a podcast episode and and talk about that. So that was a really good good episode too to <clears throat> banter around uh, the uh, the concept of whether we're creating risk or assuming risk as first responders. And it really ties right into your core message. Yeah. So that was that was kind of a neat conversation. But today we're we're kind of doing a little shift here, and uh, we're talking about dyslexia in the fire service. So. I, I guess um, before I, we jump into what dyslexia is, why why would this be a topic that you have any interest in in chatting on a podcast about? Well, number one, uh, I've known since third grade that I was dyslexic. And, you know, I didn't know the big word for it, but I knew that I had a terrible time reading, writing and spelling. It was it was a mystery to me. Um, and it, it kind of came to head when in third grade, they wanted, they wanted to pass me to the fourth grade, but my, actually my mother went to school and said, no, you can't promote him because he can't read. And they told, and she's telling me this later on in her life. They told him, well, we can't do that because he's got the highest IQ in class. And she said, I don't care. He can't read. He needs to repeat the third grade. So I can remember during that time, uh, mom took me to all kinds of doctors, not the ones in the white coats, but the ones that had offices where you sit down, they show you pictures and stuff. So I, I think that they had my eyes tested, my hearing, to all kinds of stuff. So, so they knew something was wrong, uh, but that, you know, I, I just couldn't read. And um, so that, and and that never goes away. I can remember how traumatic spelling tests were in school. You know, I've never passed a written spelling test in my life. And I'd always be the first one to sit down when there was a spelling bee. That's that's still true today. You know, I would have a hard time passing a middle school spelling test. I would most likely sit down very early on in an elementary school spelling bee. So, and we'll get into more why that is later. Um, so I knew right away I was different than the kids around me and always struggled in school. But somehow, oh, finally, in, in uh, because you and I, when we went to school, we were taught sight reading. Dick and Jane had pictures. And I can remember them telling them, tell us, telling us when you read stuff, if you don't know a word, just guess what it is, or look, look at the picture and try to figure out what it is. Well, that's the worst thing you can do for a dyslexic. And because I think you'll eventually figure out how to do it, but learning to read is not a natural process. That's very complicated within the brain because you have to, there's so many pieces that have to work. There's the auditory piece, there's the sound piece, that's the auditory. Then there's the visual in terms of looking at shapes, turning the shape into a sound, putting those sounds together and creating a word somewhere in your brain and then spitting the word back out again. That's a, that's a very complicated uh, process. And something like somewhere between 10 and 20% of the population are dyslexic. So it's, it's not uncommon. It's very common. Um, and so that, that has its own ramifications in terms of your ability to succeed in school, your socialization, your acceptance. So I knew that. So now, uh, fast forward and I'm in like seventh or eighth grade in middle school. And for the first time you get to take shop class and ours would wood shop. Well, I was very good in wood shop because as a kid, my uncles had shops and I you could use all the tools, knew the names of stuff, and it was an eye-hand kind of coordination thing. At the same time, I was in the YMCA Learn to Swim program. So I did a lot of swimming in pools. Again, that was a, an eye-hand kind of thing. I, I was successful at that. So that the YMCA and wood shop 
gave me a sense of success. Whereas academically, I didn't have that. You know, I was never at the head of the class in anything. Um, but the eye hand stuff was pretty good. And in eighth grade, in eighth grade, I won the eighth grade science competition. And it's funny because Carolyn, my wife that died last year, she also won the eighth grade science competition back in Utah. She, her demonstration was she made soap. <laughs> my demonstration was showing the difference between pulleys and how much energy it took to raise something if you changed the configuration of the pulleys. And I can remember to this day, uh, my aunts had changed their houses out and they had all these pulleys from the old fashioned windows that had weights in them. So I was fascinated by that in terms of how one pulley or two pulleys or three pulleys and how it changed. And, and I had a, a, a fish weigher and catcher that you could put on and how, how, how heavy your fish was. So I made this demonstration with, with the same amount of weights on each thing, but different configurations. And I could pull and it would show how much pounds it took a pull to raise the weight. And they were all different depending upon how I arranged the pulleys. Well, I was just having fun. Right. I didn't learn that in a book, but from mechanically trying to do that, you know, I I was showing a, a unique physics kind of experience that's that I just made up. You know, so where I came from, I have no idea. So anyway, uh, fast forward. And um, I can remember, again, vis vividly in eighth grade, they told us they took us all into the auditorium. And now we had to pick out which curriculum we were going to do in high school. And they gave us little yellow cards and like a, a pencil you would have at playing golf. You know, there's no eraser on the end of it, just a little short pencil. And um, my mother must have known this was coming because she told me, she says, you, you, when you check your card, you cannot check general studies. That's for slow kids. So, oh, wow. So now they bring us into the auditorium and the principal's up there telling us about how we're going to fix our entire high school career. And there's three choices, general, business, and college prep. Those are the three choices these eighth graders are given to, to, to decide their whole future life. Can you imagine that? No preparation, no nothing. But I, the thing I remember is that the principal stood up there and she said, if you don't like word math problems, don't pick college prep because you have to take algebra. Well, my fate was sealed at that point. I couldn't do general ed. I couldn't do college. And the only one left was business. <laughs> so I checked business. Can you imagine an eighth grader structuring your whole life? That, that's 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 ludicrous. That's crazy. Yeah. But it was the reality. So I checked it. And luckily, it did work out. Because when I got into the business program at the high school, I did much better in high school than I did in elementary and middle school. Much better. Because... Number one, there was a lot of shops. I took wood shop every year. So I had four years of wood shop. And then I took a, a auto shop, you know, because my dad was a mechanic. And then for some reason, the business classes, the accounting, uh, business law, uh, those kind of, I did well in those kind of things. I did pretty well, you know, compared to other kinds of things. American history, literature was just a disaster but and then we also had a, an ibm 360 computer in our high school in our junior and senior year so i took computer class and i learned how to program with wires and three by five punch cards and our junior and senior class for the first time our project we put the attendance records 
And the grade reports, we computerized them. So at the end of the year or quarterly, we would actually print out everybody's high school grades on a computer printout. And the kids, and we I was part of that process of doing that. You know, if I would have kept it up, I could have been Bill Gates. I mean, I guess, I don't know. But um, so, so very early on, even though I knew I was dyslexic, it gave me a hard time with some stuff, some other stuff I could get through. And now, and now it was time to go to college. I couldn't get into any college because my SATs were crap. I never took a language, but uh, mom helped me find a small business college that let me in. And sure enough, in the first semester, I went from being a CD student to the dean's list in college. And when I look back now, the reason was I was interested in the topics and there were no more spelling tests. You didn't you didn't have to write something in class and turn it in. I could write something. Mom would type it, fix all the spelling and grammar errors. errors. I would turn it in. And all of a sudden I was brilliant. I was I was still the same Bert, but the system changed. Mm hmm. The system gave me methods to overcome the dyslexia. Not that it went away, but just a way around it or under it or over it. And um, yeah, I never stopped after that. Um, the, uh, the FBI actually came to my two-year college and I got recruited to go to work for the FBI in their fingerprint department and uh, said, sure, I'll be glad to be at and they said, you know, you continue going to school, and then once you get your degree, we'll send you to be an agent. That was the pitch. So I said, great. So at 20, I got married, had graduated my two-year degree. We moved to Maryland. My wife had a job because she transferred down, and my life was set. There was a, um, a hiring freeze in the federal government in 1970. So, and I had not gotten my report date yet. So I got caught up in a hiring freeze and it didn't happen, right? So very well, I'll just wait till the hiring freeze because so I found part-time jobs. I was a lifeguard, I was a swing instructor, so I had a skill set that I could work. So I did that. And in the little in the little we lived in Landover, Maryland, and up the street from there, our apartment was the Kentland Volunteer Fire Department. And I just happened to walk in there one day, nobody was there. The story is actually in my book. And um, anyway, I fell in love with the fire service. And those, those psychomotor skills that I learned in all the shop classes, plus the teaching, swimming, and lifeguarding, those skills were very useful in the fire service. So I could learn something quickly, then I could turn around and teach it easily because it was psychomotor. Even though there were books, there were pictures to go in the book. So all of a sudden I became brilliant. Next thing I know, is you can get paid doing this? Yes. So two years later, I, I started taking tests all over the place, finally got hired in DC. And, you know, my whole career trajectory changed because now there was some place, there was an institution that my dyslexia did not get in my way. And the things I was good at were very valuable and useful and it was enjoyable. And it was like being a lifeguard all over again. But I was, instead of brown pools, I was riding on fire trucks. So philosophically it matched. It was like meant, it was made in heaven. You know, I'm not smart enough to figure it out. I'd never been in a firehouse before. So God was watching out for me or my higher power or whatever you want to call it. It was leading me to this. So it's led me to us being here today. Um, and so I never hid my dyslexia because I couldn't hide it. Uh, when I got to the, and the reason I was able to overcome that, not overcome it, but work at it, even when I did things in the fire department, they always gave me a secretary. So I would write something that was illegible, but that all the spelling was wrong. But luckily, secretaries were smart enough to figure out what the hell I was saying, and they'd write it up. And they'd fix the errors in it. And now all of a sudden, I could even communicate that way. 
I created the training programs and development. Um, and it was just absolutely, uh, absolutely amazing. And uh, got interested in smoke detectors very early on. Next thing you know, I'm lecturing at FDI, at the, uh, the um, uh, NFPA conference in 1977. Uh, Dave McCormick's in the auditor in, in the audience about smoke detectors. A year later, I'm detailed to the National Fire Academy to develop the smoke detector training program that goes all around the country. We do full scale burns and demonstrations, and all of a sudden, I am the smoke detector expert of the fire service, and I'm 27 years old, but I still can't spell. I couldn't spell ionization, but it obviously didn't matter that I couldn't spell ionization. But I knew how ionization worked compared to photoelectric. Because I could explain that. And somebody else could fix the slide to make sure the stuff was spelled right. So I never hit it. And it was almost a joke at the fire academy when I would come in and introduce classes. I say, yada, yada, yada. I said, spelling doesn't count in my class because I can't spell. So I got that burden. And, and no one thought me stupid because I couldn't spell. You know, when I go to the flip chart and write something, you know, it was it was it was un, unintelligible, but they had to listen and they got the idea. And later on, people started to record me <laughs> so that 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 failure didn't get in the way. And, and I would tell jokes that that's one of the reasons I'm going to become a doctor, because my handwriting is so bad. You know, not now I have an excuse for my poor handwriting. Well, what do you expect as a doctor? So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, became a big joke. <laughs> but then, um, so even when when LinkedIn came in, so so I always I always understood that I had a learning disability, and a lot of the people that came to the fire academy also had the same disabilities. But the fire academy was designed, at least in a lot of the curriculum, that we didn't let that get in people's way. Actually, in executive development, when we first started it and we made people do research papers, they could hand write their research papers, turn them in. And we had a whole staff of secretaries that would type it up. Yeah. Mm. So so that and fix whatever was wrong, because we knew we didn't want that to be a barrier to these chiefs, because many of them were dyslexic also. And writing was the worst thing they want to do. So we had the secretaries there to help them do that and turn it into a written paper and then share it back out again. So we had all kind of, and I think a lot of that was because I understood the need to do that. And uh, we created systems that allowed people to overcome that. And anyway, so that's, that's a long story in terms of why I think it's important because I, I do think it's been, so it's been my experience that I think the fire service has at least what the norm is, which is between 10 and 20. And I think the reality is we probably have a higher percentage of dyslexics in the fire service. If you consider volunteer and career, because we are psychomotor and reading and writing from the firefighter standpoint are not high on what we do. We're basically an oral discipline. We're experience based. Um, so did I answer your question? Yep, you did. Uh, so we talked about a lot about your dyslexic journey. So let's talk about what is dyslexia. And because there are people are probably 10 minutes into this saying, I hear him saying a lot about dyslexia, but I, they, they've either went and Googled it or, or they're, they're waiting to be told. So tell yeah. us what it is. Well, basically, dys dyslexia is classified as uh, under neurodiversity. Neural diversity just means that people's brains work differently. Um, it, it can be uh, medically, for medical reasons and physical reasons, at one end that are very debilitating. But then at the at the other end, they're not debilitating, but they you certainly do things differently. And dyslexia is classified as one of those kind of things. It was actually identified in the 1800s, the middle, eight, late 1800s, and the physician that identified it called it word blindness. That's how it was first classified as word blindness. Uh, when they when they came up with dyslexia, I'm not sure later on, but it's that it's the our brains work differently than 
the regular brain. When there's synapses in your brain and there's a certain distance between the synapses, apparently in dyslexic people, the synapses are a little bit farther apart than normal. So it's physically. So what that does uh, in the section of your brain that's based on auditory, you have you have a it's slower for your brain to process sound that then turns into text that then turns into words. So your your brain doesn't work at the same speed as other people in terms of the ability to do that. The way it's overcome is by concentrating heavily on learning phonics. So that seems to be the, the not the cure, but the intervention. And unfortunately, when you and I went to school, they got away from phonics, thinking that that wasn't needed. But for dyslexics, it really is needed. You need, you need to have a lot of it. So, um, so your your brain stuff doesn't ever change, but you learn to deal with it. Now, with that, with that, dis, with that difference, also comes some other kinds of things. Whereas uh, dyslexics are are pretty creative compared to the regular population because they have to find ways around things. They're, they can connect abstract ideas uh, differently than the norm. Many um, secret service organizations go after hiring dyslexics because they see patterns and data sets that other people don't see. Um, something like 40% of the self-made millionaires are dyslexic. But also, there's a very high percentage of people that are incarcerated that are also dyslexics. Hmm. So there's always the yin and the yang of any kind of biological person you are. Um, I'm 6'4". I was the guy that always had to put the chocks in the sprinkler heads. Right, but also the front of my helmet always had was always smashed up because my my head ran into stuff when everyone else was under it. Right, so that's the yin and the yang of everything. Um, and so again, it's been studied for a long time. Uh, it's it's not a, a a final. This is what it is. There's dozens of different definitions of what it is. Um. So we're still struggling to figure out what it is, how to how to help it. But a, but a main thing that changed me was when we're going to show this clip in a minute. The um, Made by Dyslexia Association, gee, it's, I guess it's been around almost ten years now. Uh, it was a mom whose children were dyslexic. She was dyslexic, and dyslexia was always seen as a disability. I actually listed it on my LinkedIn as a learning disability. But after I saw the clip that we're about to play, I went back and changed it. And we'll talk after you show the clip, show this clip. And, yeah. and that may give a, a picture about what dyslexia is. Okay. Um, the, uh... this, this clip was sponsored by, uh, made by Dyslexia and Richard Branson. So can you see the screen that has that on? I, I can, yep. Okay. So let me make that full screen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have a chat to you about dyslexia. Anyone be interested in having a dyslexic baby? What the hell kind of a question is that? World's first dyslexic sperm bank. Open today. Hello, good morning. What's brought you in today? Just a bit intrigued, actually. <laughs> Tell me, what do you know about dyslexia? I don't know, does that get jumbled up with writing? Is that just the pudding? You're kind of siphoned off and put in a special room. A lot of people think that people with dyslexia are 
you could have said that word used a lot. Given the choice, yeah. would you like your child to have dyslexia? No. I wouldn't kill it. I have a restaurant. Right. I've had chef for dyslexia. Okay. And there's certain things I wouldn't really give them to do at all. Only 3% of people see dyslexia as anything other than a disadvantage. But look at the people around this room. Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple, inventor of the iPhone. Who's more of an icon for genius than Albert Einstein? We've got a whole catalogue here full of people who uh, are or were dyslexic, like Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone. Dyslexics have a difference in their brains that makes them literally see the world a bit differently. What more good looking on? Love. <laughs> Do you know that 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic? Is that again? What? That's <laughs> amazing. We hadn't heard any of that. The value of these individuals and their contributions is known. Mm. And that all of these dynamic achievers need to be given up to one of the It doesn't. It's what you're trying to achieve. If you were thinking... Thinking about how most people see dyslexia, what, what words do you think you would use to describe it? Uh, at a disadvantage. It sounds like they're not. Thanks, Rich. So that when that video came out, uh, it was part of a TED Talk that um, Kate Griggs did, and it was a the, the the video it's, it was a spoof uh, about that idea, but the message was that most of the world saw dyslexic dyslexia as a disability, and they wanted to change the narrative to know that it was a gift. Uh, that dyslexic thinking was a positive thing for the individual and for society in general, uh, and and I think they've done a very good job at that. Uh, changing the whole mindset about dyslexia instead of instead of hiding it is I don't want to say celebrating it but not not seeing it as a disadvantage but as a difference that can be very valuable to society because a lot of our greatest inventions and ideas have come from dyslexics because they see the world differently and that's something to be celebrated so I saw that in myself when I look back in my career, in terms of, I always felt a little off from everybody else. From day one, uh, at the Kentland Volunteer Fire Department, everyone that wanted to drive fast. Well, when I got to be a driver, I didn't drive fast. And I put my seatbelt on. And the officers would yell at me for not going fast enough. Well, you know, if you go fast, you can have a wreck. That's not a good idea. And as, as I evolved over time, one of the things I noticed right away in the fire service is that a firefighter fatality was seen as something heroic. And that always didn't feel right to me. And when I look back in my career, starting as a lifeguard in, in the water safety system, one of the things they first teach you as a lifeguard is that the lifeguard does not exchange their life for the drowning person. That's unacceptable. That's wrong. And the lifeguard is actually allowed to let the drowning person go unconscious before they try to bring them in. So, that's almost the exact opposite of the way the fire service sees fatalities. So that always felt uncomfortable to me. And in 1976, when my lieutenant said firefighters have to get killed as part of the job, you know, that was another significant emotional event. And I was so angry at him for saying that, but that seemed to be the norm. So once he said that, that's when I wrote my first essay that I had published about how that's wrong, that if we keep accepting that, we're going to get that. Uh, and that that took me on a, a whole path in my career that I think was because of my dyslexia. 
that I knew I was the outsider, but I didn't let and I, I, I didn't hold that against my lieutenant because that was his norm. That was how he was brought up. So it was I didn't see him as a bad person, but I saw the idea as being incorrect. So even when I disagreed with people, I was not, you know, angry at them. I was angry at the idea. And where did that idea come from? And who put that notion into him that he would think that? So looking at all of my writing and even the book and the changing the title from the first book we did in 2014 to the one now, you know, I had to get up to enough courage to change the title of the book from I Can't Save You But I'll Die Trying, which is the first time I wrote the book, to the new book, I Can't Save You and I Don't Want to Die Trying. Because I knew that was so much outside of the norm. People are going to say, well, Clark, you're not a real fireman if you don't want to die trying. You know, I think that has a lot of dysfunction to it. Um, so I know there's a lot more dyslexics out there. And they see the world differently. And they need to speak up. You know, if you see something differently, be nice about it. The other people disagree with you. There's, it's because they were trained that way, and and we we can do better, and that's the whole. I guess dyslexics always try to do better, uh, and that's been a, a a thing I've tried to do my whole life too. Is just figure out how can I do better. Something happens and I have to do better, and um, so that's that's kind of what dyslexia is. It never goes away, and uh, so then then when I was given that. Uh, nice uh, award about being a, a legend. And I had been working on dyslexia and I thought back. So there's a whole story about how my, my failed my probation exam at the fire department, but luckily my Lieutenant pulled me out of the, you know, water and, I, and saved me. So again, that was a major significant emotional event in my life too. And um, uh, yeah. So Dyslexia has been part of my life. It's been uh, barriers to get in my way, but there's also it's also given me the way to see things, find ways around stuff. It's made me more empathetic uh, to the world and to myself. And I just want to share that message out there because I think there's 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 a lot of hidden dyslexics in the fire service, and um, we we it's it's not a disability; it's a gift, and we need to share it. So. Hopefully by me coming out, if you will, that'll let more people come out uh, and, and share their dyslexia, value it, and then help others with it. Is is it important for somebody who thinks that they are dyslexic to actually have a, a, a formal diagnosis, or is it enough to self-diagnose based on, you know, the the symptoms if that's the right word yeah. that that they experience and and then label themselves dyslexic there's you can go on uh i, I think uh on the show notes you're going to give a list of uh urls and you can you can go to made by dyslexia they have online tests that you can take uh to to confirm what you think i mean most people will know they, they'll in, intuitively what they will know um but if, if they want to take the test, feel free to do that. It's out there. Depends on where you are in your life. But at the same time, if, if you need organizational accommodations, like more time to take a test, uh, a quiet room, then you may need to get a formal professional diagnosis to meet that standard of the American Disabilities Act to get the assistance. So it depends on where you are in your life, right? Um, in terms of what you need to do. But you also need to know it's available because dyslexia is genetic. So if you think you are, the chances of your offspring being dyslexic are also great. So you need to know that that's available for your child if they're struggling. And just recently, I was talking to a friend of mine and the kid's in kindergarten. And the teacher was telling his mom, it's, it's, the, it's my friend's uh, grandson, that he's in he's in kindergarten, but the teacher was sending notes home saying he's reversing his 
B's and D's. And I said, nowadays, they can test as soon as kindergarten to find out if somebody has the tendency for dyslexia. So I suggested that they try to find those resources for that kindergarten kid. Because the earlier it's discovered, and then they're given services or a different way of learning, it can help them overcome that to reduce their struggles throughout their life. Yeah. What can fire service organizations do to help um, members who are dyslexic? Well, for one, I presume they can't, they can't ask, you know, because that would be a, a, a medical question. Right. Uh, so how do they, how do they, how's it uh, discoverable other than, uh, you know, self-proclamation? And then how, what can an organization do to help a member who might be dyslexic? You know, if if you think you are, I, I, I know, for example, University of Maryland Fire Rescue Institute, they will let people take their exams uh, orally. And they've done that for years. And all you had to do is ask for it. Or if somebody keeps failing something and you find that as an instructor, you may say, look, do you think if we gave it to you orally, that may help? Now, that's in the volunteer system. Now, in the career side, there's probably more legal aspects of it. And your HR department would be the ones to start contacting to find out what their standards are in terms of uh, accommodations or um, Americans with Disabilities Act, in terms of what they have to make available to people. Uh, there, there may there, there may be on, I haven't taken tests in a long time, but there, when you put an application out, it may say, do you have any disabilities, right? So that's where you have to find out what do I have to have to say, yes, I have a disability. Do I need some kind of a professional diagnosis? If you do, then you need to go arrange to do that. Um, there's also a, um, uh, on the show notes, there's um, the, there's a, we did a, we did a, a an hour long show a couple of years ago with the North American Fire Training Directors Association and about dyslexia. And one of the one of the most progressive fire departments in the world is the I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Shopshire, Shopshire Fire Rescue Brigade in Great Britain. And they've won national awards for their dyslexic program to help their employees. So again, there's a link to that in terms of what they're doing over there. So you have to do some investigative work if you think you are. Uh, and it's certainly, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this at FDIC was to encourage the, the, the training people that go to FDIC to then go back home and start asking these questions. Even if they're not a dyslexic, they should ask these questions of their system to find out what they're doing. To to capitalize on the dyslexic power that you have in your organization. Because I think there's a lot of it out there and um, it couldn't hurt and it might help at the individual level and the organizational level. So, uh, and even the discipline level, you know, um, yeah. Now, one of the, we, um stopped short of taking your personal story all the way to the uh the conclusion that um just kind of begs to be asked is with dyslexia how do you how do you go on to get a doctorate i remember in my program that i felt like my eyeballs were going to fall out of my head for the amount of reading that i had to do uh and the, and the amount of writing that I had to do. So how do you how do you get over a hurdle of that amount of reading and writing comprehension in in a program like that? Yeah. Again, um, as 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 simplistic as it may sound, I had inside of me, without knowing it, I had to prove to all those people that thought I was dumb and lazy that I wasn't. 
And that's a story you hear a lot from dyslexics. So it's about living down those early childhood memories by succeeding beyond anybody's expectations and having the tenacity to do that. So, sometimes, sometimes that kind of motivation really drives people to do things that would be impossible to think about. Um, so I think that's certainly a big piece of it. And then if you have that drive in you, you just find ways of doing it. Uh, and again, reflecting back as a child, I can remember one of the first occupations I wanted to be. I wanted to be a physician because we had this family doctor that would come to the house, Dr. Johnson, big, tall guy, always wore a dark suit, white hair, went to him as a child, was never afraid of him, liked to watch what he would do to me, give me shots and all kinds of stuff. He talked to me, actually would give me his old medical bags to carry around. Right. So that's that's my first recollection of what I wanted to be because he helps people, right? He helps people. And so that that notion was planted in me. But then, you know, as a kid, I would get a microscope and but, you know, my school system did not support those kinds of interests in me because the reading and writing was so poor. Um. But then I, as I did succeed in college because I had this business stuff, what and and now when I look back, what I really did for the for the cognitive side of learning, because I was good at the psychomotor stuff, at taking some kind of skill and breaking it down into pieces and then performing them to learn how to do them and then trying to teach it to somebody else. Because when you're teaching it to somebody else, you, the instructor learns the most, right? So when I got into college or even the business program, that that same ability to take this the psychomotor stuff, like computers, working on that IBM, and that was still moving stuff around, but you had to understand the words and structure behind it to do it. So there was a connection. Even if I had to get somebody, what does this word mean? You know, then repeating the word over and over and over again. And as long as I didn't have to spell it out, spelling it out loud didn't measure my success. Did the program work? That's what measured my success. All right. So that that ability to from doing the physical stuff, the psychomotor stuff, I I was able to, without even knowing it, translate that into the cognitive stuff in terms of breaking something down into its pieces that I could then understand. Uh, somebody could write a paper if I had to write the paper part of it. And even that, um, the, the writing piece, writing was still a mystery. But one of my last classes I had to take in my, in my uh, college class was writing the 500-word essay. And I dreaded taking this class because I knew – I was going to be discovered, you know, and be the idiot that I really was. But on the first night of class, this professor, I wish I could remember his name. He said, I don't care if you can spell the word cat. I don't care if you know the difference between a period and a question mark. That's editing. He said, I'm going to teach you how to write. So he taught us the mechanics of writing the 500 word essay. Tell him what you're going to tell him. Tell him and tell him what you told him. And he had us write a lot. When we turned papers into him, he didn't care. You never got a paper back with red ink on it. Right? And it was so it was so uh, supportive. And it was during that class and that, that example I gave about my, my lieutenant saying, you know, firefighters have to get killed. When I, had, when I had that experience at the firehouse, I literally went into the office and started writing an essay about how that made me feel. For the class, for the writing class. When I turned it into him, he said, Bertie said, this is brilliant. You you could probably get this published. And I said, you're kidding. He said, oh, no, this is good enough to be published. So he said, fine. So Fire Command Magazine, you probably remember it. Yep. Right. It wasn't like Fire Journal. Fire Journal was too hard to understand. But Fire Command, 
was for the back step guys, right? I could understand I had pictures, I can understand. So I wrote it, sent it away to Fire Command, and they published it in a 1976 July issue of Fire Command magazine, the guest editorial, I Don't Want My Ears Burned. And that went all over the country. I got letters back, typed letters from people saying, yes, Clark, great job. And I was hooked. So I knew that I knew that graduate school was much more writing. But now that I had a step-by-step -step way of taking an idea, breaking it down into pieces, so all of my writing is nothing more than 500-word essays, a whole bunch of them put in order, even my dissertation. So as soon as I was given that code to figure out how to do this, even a big project, to begin with, I think of it as a 500-word essay. And if you put enough of them together, you have a dissertation or a thesis or whatever it is you want to accomplish. So it's not overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And then you, I always had secretaries that would take my chicken scratch and turn it into typed stuff. So I didn't have to do that myself before we had computers and spell check. Mm -hmm. um, not that I answered your question or not. I mean, that's so it was that it was that internal need to overcome the sense of failure, the success of being able to do it and influence people like no other. And I was just fascinated by the stuff I was I was learning something uh, that I never understood before. and I could apply it right away. So uh, my graduate, I was at the fire academy when I first started going to graduate school and every class I would come back, I would use it in something I was doing at the fire academy to help me do my job better. So it really was a psychomotor process. It wasn't just an intellectual pie in the sky, make no difference. It was being applied just like a psychomotor kind of skill would be applied. So Ken, you had uh, in preparation for the show, sent me a, uh, a picture. Yes. That there would be a story to be told. Do you want to lead up or do you want the picture put up? I mean, let me give you a lead up. Um, the the idea of dyslexia that my brain my um my brain stru uh, structure will never change right so my dyslexia is always there uh for example at birthdays i i would never try to read a birthday card when i open it and everybody's sitting around a table because i know I will get some of those words wrong and I will stumble over stuff. So instead of embarrassing myself, I'll just say thank you and pass the card around for everybody else to read. Right? I won't read it out loud. Rarely do I take something and read it cold for the first time because I know I will stumble over it, which will impact my ability to send a message. So I make sure I have anything I've got to say ahead of time. And, and even at the fire academy, we would do the EFO graduate symposium, and there would be a note that have to be, when I was the Toastmaster, they know, don't give Burke this note to read. They'd bring it up, and i say, okay, we've got a note for the audience, and somebody else would come up and read the note. Don't give me that note. So that's how we learn to work arounds for our deficiencies. Okay, so you know, and you never know when it's going to show up. So I was I was in Atlanta at a, at the uh, uh, Fire Service Psychological Association conference, and every morning when I would go out and wait for my um, Uber guy to drive me to the conference, there was this kind of this vacant lot. I'd stand on a corner, and there was this sign across the street from this vacant lot at this vacant lot, and I would stare at this sign. Well, I stared at that sign for a couple of days and I couldn't read the sign. I could not figure out what the sign was saying, but there was no need for me to do that. Right. It, it was, it was no, there was no need for me to, to use my psychic energy to try to figure out what this was. So I just ignored it. So on the last day work waiting for the cab, this damn sign was still there. I thought, you know, damn it. I'm going to figure out what the hell that word is. So I spent 10 minutes 
figuring out what the, the principal word was in this sign. And I had to use every bit of my uh, phonics training that I could remember to figure out what this damn word was. Now, internally, I was embarrassed as shit about myself that I, I'm Dr. Clark and I cannot figure out what this word is in this sign. Just instantly. You know, when you look at when you look at something, you can figure it out instantly, right? That's where most people get to. But dyslexics don't get there. Reading a list of just words, I would stumble over most of them because they're not in a context. So that's how debilitating it can be because you feel really stupid. Here I am, Dr. Clark, and I cannot figure out what this word is in the middle of this in, the, in this middle of the sentence. Put the sign up. Put the picture up. So I stared at this sign for several days. And I could get center, and I could get four, I could get arts, but I could not figure out instantly what this middle word was in the big letters. So I had to sit there and do every trick I possibly could without putting it in Google, you know, you know and reading the definition, because I've done that too. Type in a word that I can't figure out what the hell it means, put it in, you know, and then the definition shows up and you can actually push the, 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 the sound button to say, oh yeah, that's, I, of course I know that word. I use that word, but I, I cannot decode that word. But I finally figured out what that word was, puppetry. But I can't tell you, it, like I said, it took me 10 minutes of breaking that word down into little pieces to figure out what that word was. And later on, I found the the the, uh, the puppetry museum was actually right around the corner from the hotel I was at, but I didn't know that. So there was no context for me to figure out what that sign was. So I thought, that's it. That's a perfect example of how dyslexia never goes away. Before and, dyslexic, um, you know, when take let's go back to when you were like first looking at that sign, standing on that street the street corner. What do you what do you see when you look at that? I said I, I number one, my brain my brain had not coded the word puppetry. Maybe if it was puppet, I may have got it. But in my brain, I didn't have that word puppet. And looking at those letters, I saw P-U and it was poo. So so I, I couldn't get it instantly. That's why it took me 10 minutes to go through all kinds of different ways of breaking that those letters up that would eventually make sense because I, I, I don't have automatic phonics built into me yeah. where, where you, you need to have automatic phonics to be a, a very proficient reader. Now, if it had been in a paragraph, I may have been able to figure it out because of what I was reading. Context around it, yeah. Context around it. Right. So so that's that's my that's my Achilles heel, if you will, of of not being able to just read text that is not in any kind of context, because my my my, uh, uh, my phonics are so poor. Right. I should probably go back and take the class over again, but I'm too damn lazy now. I got other stuff I got to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. But that's how powerful it is. It never goes away. So I figure if 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 I take the risk of sharing that dysfunction, you know, it may encourage somebody that feels the same way get their doctorate. Because I know a lot of people think, well, if that dumb Clark can get his doctorate, I can get a doctorate, right? So, you know, yeah. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this and share it with what is possible audience. Um, I, I yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank you for uh, we we've been at it now just about an hour, so we're going okay. to wrap on it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing that uh, part of you that some people may not know. I mean, you've been you know pretty open about it. It's on your LinkedIn 
profile and you've spoken uh, several times about it that I've seen uh, on videos and, and now here to try to bring light to the condition. Um, certainly I don't want to call it a disability because people that with dyslexia have such great successes uh, in, in life as well. It, is, it would be difficult to even put it in a category of being a disability, but right. maybe a special kind of ability. And, uh, but it, it is one that if, if people don't understand it, there certainly can be a stigma around it, especially for the person who is dyslexic to think that they're somehow not as smart because they can't read as well, or they um, stumble, you know, like reading a birthday card or something. And, yeah. and uh, I would imagine there's a certain amount of self-awareness and embarrassment that can come from that, especially if they don't really want others to know that they, right. that they have dyslexia. So Thanks right. for coming on. Thanks for being a guest. And thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for letting us use the platform. Thank you to Dr. Bert Clark for sharing your passion to educate the fire service about dyslexia. If you've been following along with me on social media for a while, you know that I took six, a six month sabbatical from teaching on the road and excluding the two years from the pandemic uh, where no one was doing anything live and in person. I had consistently delivered between 90 and 120 programs a year. Now, thankfully, organizations were willing to hold virtual training events. Otherwise, I'd, I'd probably be out of business. So taking some time off really did help to recharge my batteries and help to remind me of just how passionate I am about this topic of situational awareness. And that time off also provided some opportunities for our master instructors to step up and do some training in place of me. And now, as Willie Nelson most famously sang, I'm on the road again. So if you're interested in joining me for an upcoming program, here's where we'll be. As this episode drops, I am at the Suncor Edmonton Refinery in Edmonton, Alberta, and I'll be here until December 1st. On December 9th, I will be at the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association Conference in Ocean City, Maryland. And that'll be the fourth program that I've delivered for the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association. So thank you to Maryland Chiefs for your faith and confidence in my message and the opportunity to come back and share the situation awareness message with your members again. On January 22 through February 2, I'll be at the Syncrude Oil Refinery in Fort McMurray, Alberta. And at the conclusion of that visit, I will have delivered 71 programs for the Syncrude Oil Refinery as part of their Periods of High Vulnerability program, where we help process operators with the skills to have better situation awareness and to improve their high-risk decision-making. On February 5 through 9, I will be at the Suncor Edmonton Refinery in Edmonton, Alberta. Suncor is the parent company to Syncrude, and since Syncrude has experienced, in their words, a fundamental change in their organizational culture as a result of our training, the program is being rolled out to the other Suncor refineries as well. And this will be our third visit to Suncor Edmonton. On February 10, uh, just following our Suncor program in Edmonton, I'll be doing a program for the Canadian Task Force 2 in Calgary. And this will be my first time presenting to the Canadian Task Force 2 group, so I'm really excited about that. On February 29th, I'll be uh, doing a program for the Center for Public Safety Excellence Conference in Orlando, Florida. This will be the eighth time I've presented for the CPSE Excellence Conference, and this one will be on administrative situational awareness. So, you know, dealing things with like politics and personnel issues. On March 1 and 2, I'll be at the Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire Department in Spotsylvania, Virginia. This will be the second time I've delivered program for the Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire Department. The first one was during the pandemic and they had me do a virtual program for their members. So I'm now getting invited to come in for two days of live training now that we're past the, the curve on the pandemic. March 4 and 5, 
I will be at the University of Maryland's National Fire Service Staff and Command Program in Annapolis, Maryland. This will be my 22nd year presenting for the National Fire Service Staff and Command Program. So thank you to MIFRI for your faith and confidence in my message and giving me 22 years worth of opportunities to share this message with your um, conference attendees. April 19 and 20, I'll be at Taos County Fire Department in Red River, New Mexico. And this is especially exciting for me because this program will be the first time that my program has ever been presented in New Mexico. And it's the only state that I had left on the bucket list to present at. So next April, I get to take that one off the bucket list. And our master instructors are working hard adding programs as well. And collectively, we've got more than 30 programs scheduled from September through December of 23. So if you wanna see the list of all the upcoming programs, just go to the samatters.com website and we have a link to all of our live uh, programs upcoming. I also want to take a moment to thank the hosts of a few of our recent programs and consultations. On September 27th, I conducted a training for failure program for the Swissville Fire Department. They're a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this was the sixth program that I delivered for the Swissville Fire Department and the fire departments in the region. So thank you to Fire Chief Clyde Wilhelm for your faith and confidence in, in my message and giving me the opportunity to come back to Swissville there for the sixth time. On September 28th, I facilitated a discussion with accident, or I should say line of duty death investigators from NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health in Morgantown, West Virginia. These are the investigators that evaluate firefighter line of duty death incidents. And I'm working with them to figure out how to build situational awareness and human factors into their investigations and into their recommendations. On September 29th and 30th, I conducted two programs for the Wisconsin Rapids Fire Department in Wisconsin. One was on situational awareness and one was on preparing for retirement, you know, climbing down the ladder of success and some things to be prepared for when that happens. On October 4, I gave a presentation to the Colorado Traffic Incident Management Conference in Denver, Colorado. This is my second time delivering a situational awareness message for the Colorado Traffic Incident Management Conference. So thank you for your faith and confidence and the invitation to come back and present to your conference attendees. And November 9 through 12, I was at the International Association of the Fire Chiefs Volunteer and Combination Officer Section Symposium in the Sun in Clearwater Beach, Florida, not to deliver a program, but to deliver two scholarship awards that my company sponsors for attendees to go to the Symposium in the Sun. If you're interested in hosting a live event or a virtual program, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage, and I'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter and how to follow us on social media. There we share ideas about how to improve situation awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 396 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Burke Clark, for helping uh, the fire service to better understand dyslexia. Now, you might remember at the beginning of the show, I asked you to stick around to the end for a personal story that only a handful of people know. And here is the secret. I am also dyslexic. I told my full story about growing up with dyslexia uh, for the first time at the New York Fire and Life Safety Educators Conference in May of 22. And I got to tell you, that was a that was a tough story to tell, uh, but I'm glad I glad I got the chance to to share that. Now, for sticking around to hear this confession, I'm going to offer you a free ebook on situational awareness, just for sticking around. Just go to my website, samatters.com, click on the contact us tab, and tell me you heard the confession that I have dyslexia on my show, and you want your free book. Now, if you have any of my books already, be sure to list which ones you have so I don't send you the same book again. And it will be an ebook, so there won't be any shipping uh, that goes along with it. It'll just be sent to you by an email response. 
Thank you to our viewers and listeners for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.